Hi, and welcome to 10.4a, Coulomb's Law 1. In this lesson, students will be able to calculate the electrostatic force acting on an object. So we'll start with the critical thinking question. Is there a force between two charged objects? How can you tell? Give examples you have seen in this class or in your everyday life. Pause the video and think about it. Is there a force? Well, yeah, there is an electrostatic force. How can we tell? Because we can see objects move when charged objects are brought close to them. That's the whole idea with an electroscope. You bring a charged object close to the electroscope and the leaves move. They're at rest and then they move. So a mass is being accelerated from rest. If a mass is being accelerated, that means there must be some kind of net force acting on that object. Well, what's providing that net force? It's an electrostatic force. Charles Augustin Coulomb designed an experiment that would determine what variables would change that electrostatic force. And he was concerned with the magnitude of the charges and the distance between the charges. What was the relationship between if he made the charged objects really charged up, a big difference in the amount of protons and electrons, uh, as opposed to just a small difference, or if they're neutral, how would that affect the force felt and the distance between the two charged objects? How did he do that? By using what's called a torsion balance. This is a little animation of what a torsion balance looks like. This is drawings from his actual lab. And in the extension folder, there is a, I think it's MIT, uh, somebody from MIT recreating a torsion balance experiment. And it's basically, you see these two small spheres here? Those get charged up and they twist this wire and you're able to measure the amount of twisting that's happening. And that will tell you how much force there is. So you can vary the charge supplied to these metal spheres and you can vary the starting distance between the two metal spheres, collect some data, and then you get a nice familiar relationship. Coulomb came up with this relationship here. The electrostatic force is equal to the electrostatic constant, 8.99 times 10 to the nine Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, times the charge for each sphere divided by the square of the distance between the centers of the spheres. Man, this looks really familiar. Where have we seen this before? Newton's law of universal gravitation looks very similar. You have the force, gra the gravitational force times a constant. And now we can see that the physical property of matter, mass, is pretty analogous in this unit to the physical property of matter, charge. So here's the charge, the physical property of matter that we're talking about here. And it varies with the square of the distance because the electrostatic force and the gravitational force are both field forces. So they radiate outward like a sphere from the source object. So where is Coulomb's law? Do we have to memorize it? No. It is on page four, right over here, right underneath where we should have wrote down Q is equal to NE, just as a reminder. But there it is, okay? And where is the electrostatic constant K? Do we have to memorize that weird number? No, we do not. So the electrostatic constant is also on the front page. Actually, a couple rows above this is the gravitational constant, capital G. All right, but it's right over here. And the units are very similar, a Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, so that when we do the equation, we are left with a Newton for the force. 
So you're ready for a pop quiz, believe it or not. Since these relationships are so similar, you should be able to answer these questions. I hope this looks familiar. So this will be our base case where we have Q1 and Q2 separated by distance R, and we're gonna change those variables. And the whole point is to figure out what happened to the force. Did the force increase or decrease and by how much? So here's the first question. What happens if you triple one of the charges? Well, if you triple one of the charges, then the force is directly related to the charge. So you get three times the amount of force. Do you remember doing this type of thing? Try this next one on your own. Really try this one to remember. What happens if you triple the distance? Please pause the video and try this because there's a little trick. Did you pause the video? Remember, we're tripling this distance, which is being squared. So it's like you're putting a nine in the denominator. So the electrostatic force is one ninth as big. Did you remember to square it? Hopefully. Okay, what happens if you two, double both of the charges? Pause the video. If you double both charges, that's like putting a two times two in the numerator. So we have a four in the denominator over here. All right, another kind of tricky one. If you haven't been pausing the video, please, please pause the video now and figure out what would the electrostatic force be if you half the distance. All right, did you pause the video and think about it? Remember, not only is this being squared, so one half times one half is one fourth. So we have a one fourth in the denominator, right? And then you multiply by the reciprocal top and bottom to cancel out that improper fraction there, right? So this becomes four times as big. Which makes sense, right? Because if you bring the two objects closer together, you would expect the force to increase, right? And if they're very far apart, the force would decrease. And it's with the square of the distance. So it's not double Fe, it's four times as big. Okay, what happens if you double both charges and double the distance? Pause the video, think about it. This is that trick, all right? So if you double both charges and double the distance, you have a two times two in the numerator and a two squared in the denominator. You have a four over a four, four divided by four is one. So the force doesn't change. Even though you changed a bunch of the variables, the electrostatic force wouldn't change in that case. All right, I think this is the last one. So you have one third the distance and three times one of the charges. Tricky, tricky. Pause the video, please. What would the force, what would happen to the force? All right, so you're tripling one of the charges and this is, hmm. Both of these things, if I triple the charge, that increases the force. And if I decrease the distance, that will also increase the force. So I would expect there to be a big number next to the force. Did you get a big number? We have a three in the numerator and a one third that's being squared. So that's one squared over three squared, which is nine. Now we have to deal with this improper fraction. You multiply top and bottom by the reciprocal and you get three times nine. Did you get 27? Hopefully, I'm sure you did. And if you didn't, that's okay too. More practice. So we had done those like ratio relationship type problems when we did uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation as a separate lesson to actually using 
the law. Now we're going to be able to like do some calculations and plug in numbers, which is, I know, everybody's favorite. So we have two examples here. Um, the first one says two identical conducting spheres are placed with their centers 0.3 meters apart. So R is now 0.3. One is given a charge of positive 12 times 10 to the no negative 9 coulombs, and the other is given a charge of negative 18 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. Find the electrostatic force exerted on one sphere by the other. So we're going to use Coulomb's law. And then part B kind of connects back to 10.3, the previous lesson, where it's the conservation of charge. So the spheres are co uh, connected by a conducting wire. After equilibrium has occurred, find the electrostatic force between the two spheres. So there's the same distance apart, but now they're sharing this total charge, right? Conservation of charge. So let's start with part A. Let's start this question the way we start pretty much every problem in this class. Let's write the givens and the unknowns. So they're separated by a distance r, which is equal to 0 0.30 meters. Uh, one charge is positive 12 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. And the other charge is negative 18 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. So then you're looking for the electrostatic force but if you forget to write down the electrostatic constant, you won't get points for units. So let's look up what is that electrostatic constant. Remember, it's on the front of your reference table, K. All right. And we're not talking about the spring constant anymore. Remember, K used to be the spring constant. This is the electrostatic constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Get used to that number, 10 to the positive nine. It's a big number. Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Say it with me. It's a Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. All right, so don't be uh, too nervous about that. You're gonna have to do it multiple times there. So we'll write down the equation. Okay, Q1, Q2 over r squared we'll substitute in 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared times we'll write in the rest of this stuff so there are the two charges and we're writing in a positive and a negative think about what that would mean in terms of like is it attracting or repelling each other they're opposite charges and then don't forget to square the radius when you do your calculation, okay? So practice plugging this in your calculator. Don't just watch me do the video. Um, practice plugging in all of these scientific notations and everything and dividing by the radius squared. You should get a force of 2.1576, so we'll call it 2.16 times 10 to the, that looks like five, one, two, three, four, five, negative five. What are the units for electrostatic force? That's gonna be Newtons. And then we had a positive times a negative. That's gonna give us a negative answer. And this is where I normally don't teach a concept as I'm doing the explanation, but this is a good time to bring up an important concept, okay? If you get a negative number for the electrostatic force, that means that it's an attractive force. It's a force of attraction. We had a positive sphere and a negative sphere. This one's gonna, the blue one is pulling it towards it, all right? And the red one is pulling that one towards it. It's a force of attraction, okay? If they were both, let's say, negative, like they're gonna be in this next part. All right, let's say they're both negative 18. Then they're gonna repel each other and the direction of the force is outward this way, okay? So let's try to color coordinate it here. The green sphere is going to push it this way. That's how that works. And the purple sphere push, pushes it that way. 
I don't know if that helps. Uh, and if they were oppositely charged, like in this problem, the purple sphere is pulling the green sphere in towards it. It is a force of attraction. And we can tell because it is a negative number. So negative means attract. And a positive number will mean that it is repelling. Because remember, force is a vector quantity. So the positive and negative is now telling us the direction. It's not like, oh, it's a positively charged force or a negatively charged force. No, this, this positive and negative sign is telling us the direction of the force. Is it attracting or repelling? And how would you get a positive? We said, oh, positive is repel. Well, if it's a positive charge and a positive charge, they're going to repel each other. And a positive times a positive is a positive. You get a positive in your answer. All right. Well, what if it's a negative and a negative? Oh, you still have a negative times a negative. And a negative times a negative is a positive. And they're still repelling. So the concept I wanted to put in here is that the positive and negative sign, when you're talking about the electrostatic force, actually shows you the direction still. But now, instead of left or right, it tells us if it's attracting or repelling. Okay? So now it says for part B, the spheres are connected by a conducting wire, and then they reach an equilibrium, and then you want to know what the force is between the two spheres. So we said that it's like the conservation of charge problem where these two spheres are going to come in contact with each other. But really they're saying, okay, they're staying the same distance apart, but they're connected with a metal conducting wire. So that charge is still being shared between the two of them. So in the previous lesson, we just added the two charges together to find the total charge. And 12 plus negative 18 is negative 6 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. Okay, so that's being shared between the two of them. And then the we could say the, char, the wire's removed. So you have to split this total charge between the two of them. And you have negative 3 and negative 3. Coulombs for each one. So this one looks like it gained electrons. This one lost electrons. Now they're different charges. And let's see, will that affect the force? So remember, the force was negative 2.16 times 10 to the negative fifth newtons in this scenario. Will the force be different? I mean, the, char the total charge stayed the same, but is the force going to be different? What do you think? Make a prediction. Well, even just looking at here, they're attracting. Here, they're like charges. They're both negative. So the force is now going to be repelling. We're going to get a positive number. So at the very least, the sign is going to change. And then if you think about it, it's the same distance apart, but we have some very different magnitudes going on over here. So what do you think is going to happen to the electrostatic force? Let's use Coulomb's law. Substitute in our new charges and the other values. And by the way, sometimes if it's the same exact charge, if you want, you can definitely just square this charge since they're both the same. And now, as predicted, we get a positive number because these two negative charges are repelling each other. And it's a positive 8.99 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons, which is smaller than our original force. So not only did the direction of the force change, but the magnitude of the force changed as well even though the total charge remains the same because of the law of conservation of charge. Okay, so that's how you handle this. You could try example two on your own, all right? Uh, pause the video here. You might get tripped up by this. This is a prefix, just like a millimeter or a centimeter. You could have a millicoulomb, or this is a microcoulomb. 
And on the front of the reference table, they tell you what this prefix is for. So you could read this problem and try it on your own. So this is the given, these are the givens. And then don't forget to write K, which is located right here. And not only is K reminiscent of the spring constant, which is kind of confusing because they're very different, but in this unit, the micro prefix comes up, which makes me think of the coefficient of friction, right? Didn't we use the Greek letter mu for the coefficient of friction? Well, now it's popping up again, but this time it's totally different. It's a prefix for micro, which is 10 to the negative six. So you could set up a nice conversion you know I like to convert by writing the units down here that we want to get rid of because these will cancel. We're going into Coulombs. And this does tell you, okay, the 10 to the negative 6 number, that is the number of base units that one of the prefixes is equal to. So you put this number where the base unit is. And you could do that. So it's, it turns into 7.3 times 10 to the negative six. If you don't want to think of it that way, we're at the point in the year where I could show you this little trick, all right? If you want to, you can replace the prefix with times 10 to the negative six. And that this tells you what to replace it with. So what do I mean? I'm going to keep the same thing, 7.3, replace mu with times 10 to the negative six, and then just write coulombs like that. And it's basically the same thing. If, you, if it's easier to see, okay, let me just replace the micro with times 10 to the negative six. If maybe it's easier to see and work with instead of multiplying by the conversion factor, but really that's what we're doing. Um, and it's a good technique to know how to do because it's pretty much universal when converting units. Not this though, this is not universal. I mean, what if you have Coulombs and you wanna go into micro Coulombs, then you can't just like replace the micro thing, you'd have to do the conversion factor. Anyway, that was a tangent. Let's continue on by writing down the uh, Coulombs law. We'll substitute in, and this time I'm actually gonna write the units in the equation so you could see again how these cancel out. So the goal is to be left with units of Newtons. So we have to get rid of this other mess over here. How does that happen? Well, we have a Coulomb times a Coulomb in the numerator, and then this is like in the denominator of the numerator. So the Coulomb uh, and the Coulomb, they cancel with this one here. And then we have a meter being squared in the denominator and a meter squared in the numerator. So those will cancel, and the only units you have left are Newtons. So that's why the units for the electrostatic constant look super weird. It's really just so that the Coulombs and the meters cancel, leaving you with Newtons, because we're looking for the force. So when you do the multiplication and you're making sure you're squaring the radius and everything, you end up getting negative 2.05 times 10 to the negative one units for electrostatic force. We just went over it all, Newtons, okay? And what does this negative sign represent? It represents the direction. Is it attractive or repulsive? It is going to attract. So negative means attract. And if you forget, you could always look back and say, oh, what were my charges? My charges are opposite, so it must be attract, right? But if you want to remember the fact that the force, uh, if it's negative, it's attracting. If it's positive, it's repelling, okay? And then part B is very similar to the part B in the previous problem. Um, it's a conservation of charge. 7.3 microcoulombs plus negative 4.5 microcoulombs gives you positive 2.8 microcoulombs, which is split evenly among the two spheres. So each one has positive 1.4 microcoulombs of charge after they're brought into contact and then separated. So now instead of these, 
we have positive 1.4 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And when we plug it into our Coulomb's law, what do you think is going to happen to the force? Is it going to stay the same? Is it going to be different? Let's take a look. You end up getting positive 1.22 times 10 to the negative 2 newtons of force. So again, we went from an attractive force to a repulsive because they're both positive. They're going to repel each other. And the magnitude of the force decreased. Okay? So, great. That's about it. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.